Welcome to episode 129 of the Actual Astronomy Podcast. This is going to be uh, the night vision dark adaptation, uh, or, or maybe we should call it, is, is orange the new red? Episode. Well, it, it might be, right? <laughs> it might be. It might be. I'm Chris. Joining me is Shane. We are amateur astronomers. We are not professionals. So take that for what it's worth. And this podcast is for anyone else who likes looking up the nighttime sky. And we sure love doing it. So this week I sent you uh, a text of my amber reading light. And you said, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I said. And then it, it spurred on a little bit of reading and research. And uh, I am intrigued. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So we, we, you go through this, this astronomy for a long period of time. This, this is sort of my introduction to the amber light and astronomy is I'd, I'd always heard that the red light, that's where it's at. That's if you want to keep your uh, night vision, you need to have a red light um, because the eye isn't that sensitive to red lights. Um, and then over time, you know, we're, we're going out, we're doing lots of astronomy and I see folks coming out. Sure. They've got red lights, but they're like 10,000 lumens, not that, but they're, they're crazy bright. And I'm like, this, that is ridiculous. So they're trying to get their, their illumination level up so that they can actually do whatever it is that, that they're trying to do. And we're all differently sensitive to light. Um, but certainly the red lights when used properly, they are extremely dim and it's really hard to do very much of anything with them. It's hard to read your labels. It's hard mm -hmm. to navigate if you, when you go to walk to the washroom, all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's one thing that has annoyed me, uh, in astronomy. Um, and one of the reasons why I start to mark up my, uh, Atlas now with, you know, little post-it notes pointing to the objects I want to observe. It's because reading like, you know, your, your observing list and then trying to find things in the Atlas under a red light isn't easy. Like it's hard to read the words and like, you know, I know I don't have great vision, but you know, that's why I wear glasses. So my vision is corrected. And with my glasses, I'm like, you know, 20, 2015 vision, like it's outstanding vision, but under a red light under, you know, low light that, uh, is part of that. It's just tough to read using yeah. that. Yeah, it is. So what, what happened was, uh, I'll, I'll give you my, my initial, uh, well, here, here's my, my recent, um, journey on this, um, is that I, I've been trying to do some sketching. I'm, I'm not a great artist or anything like that, but I do, I do really enjoy doing the astronomical sketching. So I've been going out and I get out to my site and I get all set up and everything. And then I'm like, you feel like you got to be an octopus. You got to hold your clipboard. You're holding, um, like in this case, um, I'm holding my um, hand paddle for the telescope to, to keep my object tracking just because I, I don't bother to align, but I, I use the hand paddle just to just to keep things in the field of view off. And I do that because I know it is late, I'm lazy, whatever. You know, that's just how I observe. And I've got my pencils, multiple pencils, and then I'm only picking one pencil out because I'm trying to hold the clipboard, hold the light, hold the hand paddle. Like, like I need three hands, right? So I was looking around to see what other observers have done. I noticed, I think it was uh, Jeremy Perez or, or, or somebody um, like that. He's a pretty famous sketcher. Anyway, he, uh, he had like a double gooseneck. So it's like a, like a flexible um, arm. And then on both ends, there's clamps. And then he would clamp one to the clipboard and clamp one to his uh, red light. And I'm like, oh, well, that would work. It would add some weight but it mm -hmm. would work. So I started looking around for a good solution. So the only one I could find weighed like a kilogram, which seems ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. It seems kind of heavy unnecessarily. And I found one that was lighter. That was, that's for, for photography purposes. Like you clamp it to something and then you can get it to like hold a flower or I don't know what, like a butterfly or something. I don't know. And, and that one was like a hundred dollars. It was $94 mm -hmm. Canadian. I was like, I'm not, spending that. Like, I just need something to hold a little light, right? Like this, this should be easy enough. So, um, we're for a walk. And I was <laughs> saying to my wife, I said, this is what I need. Like, do you have like any suggestions? Because, you know, this should just be an inexpensive thing. And, uh, cause I, I want to spend my money on telescope stuff, not something to hold my light. Right. You know, but if I just have to hold my light on the, on the paper, I guess that's what I have to do. And like, the other thing is, is that when you hold your light, 
And what I do is I just sort of hold it flat against the paper because that's the only way to do it. Um, and it's brutal, like, cause it has like this weird illumination pattern. It's completely uneven. So sometimes like your sketches will distort because of this, at least mine hmm. will, cause I'm, I'm not really a great sketcher. Um, <laughs> anyway, so she said, well, just, just get like a little, uh, a little reading lamp. And I mm-hmm. thought, well, I don't know. Like, I mean, it's still going to be bright. I guess maybe I could like, maybe I'll just put like some red duct tape on it or, or whatever. Cause I'm thinking it's good. They're going to be bright and everything seems so bright these days. You know, like you look at the light on a, on a freaking uh, cell phone. I mean, geez, it's like, like a headlight on a car almost now. Right. Mm-hmm. Anyway. So I thought, well, it's going to be like, that. I'll dim it down or maybe there's dim ones. So I look and almost like the first hit, I didn't even put in like night observing lamp or anything like that or, Anyway, the, the first hit was an amber um, reading lamp. It was it was a dimmable amber reading lamp is what it's called. And it was $16. <laughs> so the price is right. It's, it has a rechargeable battery. So I'm not like creating all this battery waste. And then um, it's dimmable. It dims down to 20 lumens or something like that, which according to what, I, I don't know that much about lumens, but according to what I could find, it seemed like it was about half the the uh, illumination of what, a, of what my red light is when I'm using it. So I thought, okay. well, even though it's a different color, that should be good. So I'm just like, I'm ordering it and sort of even stepping back further, I'd heard of using amber lights before uh, for astronomy. And I have been interested in, in doing that. So recently when I was reading uh, about how to set this up, I read about some sketchers who prefer using amber lights and then I recalled that uh, Robert Dick, who's the past chair of the uh, uh, Light Pollution Abatement Committee for the RASC here in Canada, he had done this big thing on amber lights, uh, I think it was maybe about eight or nine years ago. And I remember I was at one of the general assemblies and he gave a presentation and I was really keen. I said, hey, like, I want one of these lights. Can, can you give me one? He wouldn't give me one. He said I, I could buy it, but it was, it was going to be a lot of money. And I wasn't sure about it, so I didn't. I didn't do it. Uh, I was like, eh, it "Seemed like a bit of money," and I, I didn't know it didn't. It wasn't dimmable, and there was a few other things. So I was like, "Well, maybe one day I'll I'll do this." So I'm doing this now. So I got this little amber light, and I have a dark place in my house that I was able to take it into. I haven't tried to take it out and do any sketching with it yet, but uh, I think it's gonna. I think it's gonna work really, really well. So. So then we were talking about like, hey, what should we do for our second episode this week? So what about dark adaption? <laughs> yeah, it just seemed like, you know, a, a lot of what we talk about here are just what you and I are talking about outside of the podcast. And then we bring the conversation here and record it. That's right. So Shane, what is dark? Now, is it dark? Now, I, I, this is not in my notes or anything, but sometimes... I refer to it as dark adaptation, but it seems like it's written out as dark adaption. Hmm. Well, I like adaptation, but maybe that's the Canadian in me. I'm not sure. Um, must be. Must be. Yeah. 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 But what, what that is, is our, our light or sorry, our eyes have to adjust to uh, kind of the, the light, uh, the levels of light that are around us. So mm-hmm. um, when you are, you know, out in the daytime or there's lights on in your house, um, your eye is set to, um, kind of reduce the amount of light it, it takes in. So it's not overwhelmed by all of the brightness. Yep. Now, when you go into a dark room or under a dark sky, your eye changes so that it can pull in as much light as possible so that, so that it can see in low light conditions mm-hmm. and dark adaptation uh, doesn't happen instantly. Now the eye quickly adjusts to uh, darkness uh, so that, you know, you can see and you can navigate. However, for astronomical purposes, uh, it can take uh, up, you know, around 30 minutes for you to achieve not full dark adaptation, but uh, you know, pretty close to, to uh, you know, full, full adaptation. Yeah. And so what happens, and this, this really isn't in the notes because in, in my, my reading that it's not, it's not as well explained in the books that I have or anything, but um, you know, your iris actually opens up, right? So your, your pupil kind of appears to, to dilate um, and that allows more light to come in, but sort of the strange part about that. And this, this is kind of the, sort of one of the things that people may not think that much about is 
that only allows the light to come in, but it doesn't start working right away because there's biological and, and maybe even to a certain extent, psychological processes that take place that actually cause you to be able to see in the dark, even though the light is coming in, you know, like you were saying, you go from a bright area to a dark area. Like, so when you walk into that darkened theater after maybe the show has begun or just before it begins and, and everything is still uh, darkened down, but there's still like the sconce lights on the walls and lights coming in from, you know, and there's people with their cell phones, like there's, there's, there's some light in there. But when you first walk into a dark area like that, it feels like you just walk into a dark wall almost, you know, mm-hmm. um, and, and, and it takes you a minute, but your, your iris will, will, it should dilate almost like right away. Like your eyes should open up and let that light in almost right away. But then there's, there's a chemical process and a psychological process um, that takes place that actually allows you to, uh, to navigate uh, under low light conditions. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so I bought a book that arrived last week. Uh, I probably should have mentioned it on the previous episode, but um, it's visual astronomy of the deep sky. And uh, you encouraged me to to do some reading there before this episode. So I did read oh, good. Uh, kind of the entire uh, uh, beginning portion before it got into the sketches and everything. And uh, some really interesting points on, uh, about dark adaptation that I just wasn't aware of. Um, do you want me to get into that? Or I, I don't Go. know if that'll throw no, the cadence I'm, I'm, off here. You've started. I'm curious. Let's hear it. Okay. So we've always talked about 30 minutes as kind of the time required to get your dark, darkly or dark adapted eyes ready for astronomy, which is yeah, still you. the right thing, right? It's about 30 yeah. minutes. Right. Get but your dark on. Yeah. Get your dark on. Yeah. <laughs> but, but in this book uh, by Roger N. Clark, he talks about that uh, biological change in your eyes that happens to allow you to see more at night or, or to be more sensitive to light. And um, I didn't realize, but that, that process carries on for at least a couple of hours, actually. Yeah. So yeah. even though the first 30 minutes is where you get most of your dark uh, adaptation, it still goes on from there. And that's, you know, this, this is really interesting to me because it really does tie into the usage of even red lights under yeah. a dark sky while doing astronomy. Yeah. Um, if you're using a red light that is too bright, it's, it's still going to damage your dark, your dark, uh, your dark adaptation, like your ability yep. to see, especially that last little bit that happens over, you know, a couple of hours. Yep. Um, so very interesting. Uh, yeah. the other thing that was very interesting to me in here is he talks about leading up to like a, a dark sky session where you want, you know, to be able to see the, the faintest objects. You want to be able to tease out the faintest details, um, he talked about preparing a couple of days in advance of observing. And what he talked about was your, su- uh, your eyes exposure just to sunlight. Yeah. Um, and that you need to start thinking about that a couple of days before your, your evening observing session at the telescope. Um, and what you should be doing, you know, for a couple of days up to that point is if you're outside in the sun, make sure you're wearing sunglasses with UV protection, because that helps, um, kind of in in your preparation for your dark sky session. So that was something else I didn't know about, you know, that days leading up can impact, um, your observing. Now, I don't believe that what I just shared will have like a dramatic impact, you know, on on what you can see. If you couldn't see M33 before, I don't think this is going to allow you to see it now. Mm -hmm. I think it'll just help you tease out a little bit more, you know, faint, faint features or, or potentially some faint objects. Um, now I'm just speculating. I, you know, I, I don't think it would have a substantial difference. I, I suspect it would almost be like, you know, when you start comparing eyepieces for the most part, they're all the same, you know, it's just at kind of the thresholds is where you start to notice some differences. Yeah. Um, but regardless, I found it quite interesting. Um, you know, that, that you're, you know, getting your eyes ready for darkness and, and observing, uh, is far more involved than I ever thought. Yeah. So, so I've, I've had that book, I've, I've done lots of reading on it and, and sort of one of the things that I do, which I'm not necessarily doing for dark adaption, um, is that, um, it's, it's just sort of my, my own personal biology and the way that I work, my, maybe my SCOTO biology here for the, for this topic is that, um, like I find when we go to observing, like if we go to grasslands or something like that, 
like I get very tired in the evenings. I, I guess this is not unusual. Most pe- most people do, um, but I find it difficult to to observe. And so often, what I'll do, and you, you'll know this, you'll recognize this, is that I'll often observe for an hour or two, and I'll go to sleep. Mm-hmm. I'll I'll go to sleep for a couple hours, and then I'll get back up and observe. And it's it's astounding um, how much more I can see when I wake back up. So so even though you know it's been dark for a while, we're using red lights. Um, you know, we're, we're in the right environment. It's a dark place. Um, you know, I, I do an hour, sometimes two hours of observing, and then I go to bed um, and I try to sleep for a couple hours. Um, when I get up, the, it's it's astounding how much more I can see. So when I go to bed, I kind of got to use my red light to get in my tent and, and I, you know, to kind of get settled in my tent. Oh, my sleep bag's turned around. I, uh, where's the zipper on it or whatever? I don't have a zipper on my sleeping bag. But, you know, wherever it snaps up, different things like that. I got my red light in there to, to kind of navigate, right? Because my tent is, is a full four-season double-walled tent because we observe in a harsh environment and you need to have a lot of protection. Um, but when I wake back up two hours later, no red light is needed. I, I can get up. I can put my shoes on. I can see the steps on my tent. I can see my zippers. Um, I'm out observing. No red light needed at, at all. I can just read my star charts almost. And then I, I do turn my red light on. I have it with a piece of parchment paper on it and at the very dimmest setting or most dim setting or whatever. Um, yeah. And boy, you sure see lots that like, let me tell you, you will get a bump in that situation, but that's just sort of how I observe. Right. I mean, that that's my, my observing style that I've had for years. So, and it just happens to, to work pretty good um, for dark adaptation as well. Hmm. Yeah. Um, the, uh, that, that's another interesting point is just kind of, uh, the fatigue, you know, that, that you have, um, in your eyes, like, you know, if you've been up all day, uh, that certainly weighs on your ability to, to see uh, or get fully adapted. Um, but also, um, like some other aspects too, a little bit of your age can play into this. Um, Mm -hmm. but, um, uh, what I found intriguing that, you know, maybe if I circle back a little bit to just the, the amber light versus red light, Mm -hmm. um, you know, we talked about how using a red light, it is hard to read star charts. It's hard to read observing lists. And it's just because our eyes struggle with that wavelength of light. And it, Mm. it, it, it almost makes things like blurry to me in a way, at least like letters. And, uh, it's frustrating. And what most of us do to compensate for that, me included, is you just, you have to turn up the level of the light. So your red light is now getting brighter. Yeah. And um, no matter what, like just the fact that it's red doesn't mean it doesn't impact your your night seeing. It does. And you still want to keep your light levels, no matter what color, as low as possible. And so as I dug into this a little bit, because, you know, you really got me going down a rat hole on this one where, okay, all right, where I was very interested, um, you know, some people are even speculating and, and putting kind of, you know, m- more than just words, like some data out there to say, you know, a white light at low, low, low levels might be less harmful to your night vision than a red light at a higher level that some yeah. of us use while we're observing. Yeah. So then, you know, on and on and on here in, in my journey of reading, um, the speculation was that, um, or the theory was that, you know, the amber light is kind of the best of both worlds. Cause you still don't want white light. You know, you'd like yeah. to, you know, you would like it to get more to that red spectrum because it is less impactful on your night vision. Yeah. Um, but the, the thing that is, uh, happening with the amber light is it doesn't, it's a different wavelength. So when it's lighting up your star charts and your lists, our eyes, like you can read it uh, a lot easier or, or better, you know, it doesn't have that sort of blurriness to it. So yep. as a result, you can turn the amber light down to a much lower level than probably what you would have using the red light. So now my mind is blown and I'm thinking I need to find myself a dimmable amber light to start using because I, I don't have one right now. All of my lights are red because, you know, this, this is what you read about in every astronomy book. This is what you and I have said on this podcast quite a bit actually is, you know, thou yeah. shalt use a red light you know, yeah, when you're know. doing astronomy. Well, I got it. I got a bit. It was pretty funny when, when I got it set up and I sent you the photo and you were like, Mike's going to kill you. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like Mike's gonna like that. I can't wait to see what he has to say. Ha ha ha. And I'm yeah. like, no, no, there's science behind this. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. do I does science. I know what I was talking. You know, like it's it there's science here behind this. It's crazy. Yeah. But yeah, um, so Rob Robert Dick, he's the one that kind of turned uh the amber light on in, in my mind all those years ago, but he 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 I think he had brighter ones than what he ought to have, right? Mm. So it's it's pretty wild. It's pretty wild. Yeah, it's sort of mind blowing in a way that you know you you can go through this whole journey of astronomy and then and then somebody turns you on to that. But yeah, so so this one has got a uh, twenty lumen level, and apparently, like I don't know, I, I don't have like a light measurement device, but but my red light is a reputable Rigel Systems red light. And so you can actually look up the specs and whatever. And somebody said that this red light that I have on, on its lowest setting is 40 lumens or something like that. I could be wrong. Uh, I don't know that much about this, but I was astounded at how much better I could see the amber light at 20 lumens than the red light at 40 lumens. Like how much better you could read. Yeah. Like it, honestly, it just seems like, it just seems like a regular light. I, I, I'm, my mind is really blown now. So the only, the only way to really test this is, is to go out and use it. It just, it hasn't, it hasn't worked out that, uh, that I've been able to get out for, for a variety of reasons to do some sketching. I'm in my yard. I've got lots of amber light in my yard, uh, from the street lights. Um, so I don't need, I, I can do sketches in my yard without, without a light. So it, th- this is not a place I can test it, but, um, anyway, yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty wild to think about pretty wild to think about. Yeah. I, uh, you know, and I bought, um, a flashlight just a couple months ago and it's, a. Uh it's, I wasn't planning on using it for astronomy. Um, it's not your typical flashlight where the light, you know, comes out of the end of the barrel. It, the, the light is actually at like a right angle to the barrel. So you can uh, sit this thing down on a desk and it just, you know, shines, uh, okay. I guess, perpendicular. Um, and it has a magnet at the bottom. So, you know, you can attach it to magnetic things to provide light. And then it has a, a spot where you can slide a colored filter over top of of the light and it comes with white, red and green filters. So the red though is actually more of an amber tone, um, when it's lit up. Um, but the thing with this light is like, you can turn this thing down to 0.5 of a lumen. So you can, you can have it extremely, uh, low level. Um, and then it goes, I think from 0.5 to 10 and then a big jump to 50, but I'm kind of intrigued now by the potential of this little flashlight and using it, um, you know, cause it is more amber than red and I can yeah. get the levels pretty low on it. So this, I think I'm going to play around with this actually and, and see if I can make this my new astronomy light. Yeah. So maybe, uh, maybe we should t- talk a little bit about the, the physiology of the human eye. So, um, we've got these two types of photoreceptors. They're called rods and cones and mm. they are distinguishable by their structure, <laughs> no doubt, right? Um, the cone photoreceptors, the, these are the ones that are conical in shape, and uh, they contain um, the visual pigments that are going to, that are gonna, uh, you know, help you out for seeing stuff, um, you know, in, in the daytime. And so they're very sensitive, um, you know, to, to your daytime types of light. The rod receptors, uh, they only contain uh, one type of pigment, and that's called rhodopsin. And this is the peak uh, sensitivity for nighttime use. And now, when, you, when you're reading this stuff, it talks in these nanometers of light, which honestly, it doesn't really m- make any sense to me because I, I really don't know what these numbers mean exactly. But it's 530 nanometers of light, which uh, corresponds to like a, br- a blue-green uh, light wavelength. And that's why, you know, if you're fully uh, dark adapted, you'll see sort of things being uh, maybe more of a, of a bluish uh, green. And these rod photoreceptors, um, they're, they're not evenly distributed on your, in, inside your eye. So basically, they are concentrated towards the outside um, portion of your vision, and they decrease towards the central part of your fovea, which is, which is the main you know, center part of your vision. So as visual astronomers know, because of this, um, 
that's why we use averted vision. That's because um, when you look at an object and you focus your attention just off the side, you're going to see things much better than if you just try to look at something directly. Basically, you're using your peripheral vision when you're looking at the nighttime sky, whether it's with the unaided eye through a binocular or through a telescope, you try not to look directly at the thing that you're looking at, but to use your peripheral vision, right? So you're familiar with this, but this, this is why. It's the structure of where these photoreceptor cells are, these rods, where they are in your eye, they're sort of around the edge of it, right? And that's yeah. what we use for our night vision. Yeah. And, and you and I have talked a little bit about like learning to see better at night and through a telescope. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is one of the, uh, like pointed areas that we're talking about, about learning to see better because learn like using your peripheral to try to study an object through a telescope is not an easy thing because your natural tendency is to focus on what you're looking at, not what's through your peripheral. And it's, it's a weird thing to to try to elaborate with words. And it's probably even stranger to actually do in practice. And this is one of those things that the more you do it, the better you will get at it. Yeah. I always feel like I was kind of doing my, my hick impersonation there because like, I work on a scientific study and then sometimes I have to get really smart people to explain like pretty basic psychological concepts to me. And I always feel like they, they, they're kind of like, I always feel like, yeah, I'm, I, you know, I need the hand and puppet show, right? <laughs> like mm -hmm. it, it seems like it's fairly, uh, fairly complex. And this stuff kind of starts feeling like, like we're treading into that realm and we're not physiologists and we're not biologists and, you know, uh, any sort of thing like that. But what, what it boils down to is that when you look at stuff in the night sky, well, first of all, it takes a while to adapt at least 30 minutes. And honestly, you really don't notice a, a, the, the main benefit until you're out like, 60 minutes, I'm going to say, that's when you really start to notice it. And then on top of that, um, you need to use this averted vision um, because the, the cells in your eye, the physical cells in your eye that you're using, they're on the edge of your, and where your peripheral vision is. That's, that's where they live. Yeah. 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 No, that's a good explanation. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully that works. Yeah. So your cones actually will um, dark adapt as well. So they're the ones that actually adapt for that first 10 minutes or so. And then it's, and then there's this rod cone break it's called. And then that's when your rods really take off is, is after about that 10 or 12 minute point. Um, but like that first little bit, like when you go into the theater and then you can kind of start seeing that's because they've illuminated up to a certain level, or if you're planetary observing, that's, that's all you need. Like in my, in my experience, and I've done this, that's all you need to do good planetary observing is just that first 10 minutes or so. And it doesn't need to be super dark. It just needs to be dark enough. But in fact, having uh, quite a bit of external light around will allow you to see um, color better than if you super dark adapt in a super dark location and then try to look at Jupiter. Jupiter will look a bit washed out. Whereas for my light polluted backyard, it's horribly light polluted. And I have, I have enough amber light there that I can sketch. It's actually, I, I would love to turn it down about 10 or 20%, even for sketching purposes. If it was down 20%, I'd actually be a happy camper. But at bright, as bright as it is when I was looking at Jupiter through a 50 millimeter telescope a couple nights ago, I could see like one of the equatorial bands as like a very brownie red, like without any question in my mind, I was seeing tons of color on Jupiter because um, I'm into that, just that cone uh, what's called the cone mediated threshold. You know, it's, uh, I'm just dark adapted um, enough with the cones and I'm able to take in uh, lots of good nightlight. Uh, but at the same time, I'm able to still to see color. Um, I'm not really getting my rods dark adapted in my backyard. So anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, similar, similarly, like the, the dark adapta adaptation required for planetary observing just isn't nearly the same. And, uh, you know, for, for those purposes, I don't really worry about it too much either, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. Now one thing, and I, I didn't put this in the notes and I, maybe I should have is the business of, um, I think it's called night sky on myopia. I'm not sure how familiar you are with this. I, I haven't played around with it recently, but I certainly did a number of years ago. No, I'm not familiar with this. 
So almost what you might have it, I think I'm not diagnosing you with a, with a condition here, Shane, but uh, you may, you may wish to discuss it with your optometrist if, if you, if you feel comfortable doing so. And what this is, is that some people notice this blurriness that you refer to. I actually don't get that. Okay. And what happens is it's almost like you need an extra um, 0.25 or maybe 0.5 diopters at night in order to see things clearly. So for me, and I, I've done some reading on this, there's a short article by, by our good friend, Dave Chapman in the Observer's Handbook where he touches on this. Um, and so I experimented this. You can get these things, they're called flippers and they're not for, they're not for swimming. I just thought that up. Um, <laughs> what, what they are is they're, they're sets of, 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 of what, what they call flippers that are inside that mechanism when you go to the eye doctor and they kind of flip a button and mm-hmm. then it kind of, and they say, is this better or worse or whatever? So, so I had this doctor and she was so cool. Uh, her name was Doc Martin and, oh. <laughs> and she lived, she lived it. Let me tell you. Um, and she was my eye doctor um, years ago. And so I was kind of, you know, looking at this at that time and I went in and chat chat to her and she actually booked me like an extra half hour so we could because she was she was into astronomy a bit too and so we we talked about this so she loaned me um some of these flippers <laughs> to, to take out and do astronomy with she was curious to find out um you know what i would discover so what i did is i i took some of these flippers out and i found out that i i would get a bit of a bit of a benefit by having about 0.25 or in one eye and 0.5 diopters in the other eye. So we made me up a pair of uh, Zeiss glasses. Um, you know, she get, I got them at cost because I bought a whole pile of other stuff um, just for my like contacts and regular stuff like when I was a younger person. And, and then I got a pair of these. Um, and I used them for years until kind of my eyes, eyes progressed to that point. And then I could just wear them as like regular glasses. Um, and then now I'm, I'm sort of even worse than that. Um, but I got a really big benefit by having an extra 0.25 and an extra 0.5. I forget which way, plus or minus or something like that. I, I figured it out, wrote it down, and then she wrote me the prescription. And I was able to, to have this astronomy pair of glasses. And so what it did is in, in the night sky and when using a, a dim red light or maybe even without a red light, if, if I was in like a town or a city or something, if I was on a lawn and I was wearing my regular glasses, the ground appeared as a flat homogeneous surface. Okay. Mm -hmm. It was just basically just a dark mat that I was walking around on. And when I, when I got these special glasses made for doing astronomy, I could see the the blades of grass. Hmm. And that's a big difference. Yeah. It was a really, really big difference. Now through the telescope, it kind of doesn't matter that much. This is what I found out over time is that it's a lot better for being around and navigating and it's way better for like reading your star charts um, and, and things of that nature. But actually for the looking through the telescope, it eh, doesn't really matter that much because you're just focusing it, right? Yeah. Um, so anyway, so, so this does occur as well as, as part of your uh, night sky adaptation. So some people notice it more or less. I found like really 0.25 diopters. Well, in fact, my glasses have been off by 0.25 diopters for uh, a couple of years now, because um, when I, when I went to the eye doctor the last time I go through these periods where I find I'm very sensitive to it. And then I go through periods where I I can't even notice it at all, even if I try. And what it comes down to is if if I'm really tired, um, I notice that my eye just doesn't adjust as well. But when I'm well rested in that, my eye just really well. In fact, I, there's times where I can almost get by without wearing glasses, um, except for like writing or working on a computer. Um, but for reading, I, I actually have never needed glasses for reading. And so when I read now, I often take my glasses off um, because I'm able to adjust, right? It's just, it's just, I'm just, I just don't have the good distance, right? You know, I can't drive a car without glasses, but honestly, that's really about it, right? I think I look smarter with glasses and, and I need that. yeah but baffle them with whatever you have to do (laughs) exactly exactly so all right so so we talked a little bit i talked about my my sort of experience with my own eye doctor and 
And, you know, for people out there, you, you, you have to kind of weigh your, your eye doctor appropriately. So some of them are going to be more interested in talking about this stuff than others. And so you have to be careful not, not to waste too much of, of their time and go down too many rabbit holes. So, um, I I've had some eye doctors that don't care. And I've had some that are like, Oh man, next time book another half hour. We gotta, we gotta get into this. Right. Or like, I think she had had written a paper on dark adaptation when she was um, a grad student and had given that to me to like, she was really into this. So it was awesome. Um, What are some things you can do? Do you ever, I think we've talked about this just ourselves before. And we've never talked about this on the podcast, but we've actually talked about diet. You and I, Mm -hmm. Yep. (laughs) So what did, what did we talk about there, Shane? Well, I remember, um, I think it was blueberries you were into for a little while. Um, to I'm, help always with, into, yeah, to, I'm always into blueberries. Yeah. To, to help with night vision, but you know, it, it, I think you'll get into some of the details, but you know, certainly like your kind of your general health, uh, can certainly influence your ability to see at night. Yeah, for sure. So there's, there's a few things and there's things that, that, that you can do. So we were talking about how long it takes to get dark adapted and whether or not some of those things will make a difference. You know, I've heard of astronomers sitting in a closet for an afternoon. I actually think that, um, you know, I, I have better things to do with my afternoons. I, I don't think I could commit that to it. Um, I think, yeah, if you can lie down and close your eyes before observing for a couple hours and sleep and get well rested, that's honestly, that's going to be your best bet for good observing is to be well rested. And then the, the other thing is, yeah, if you're lying in a darkened tent um, or somewhere before observing, then um, that is going to give you a really, really good benefit. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, shoot, you know, wear your sunglasses, you know, but don't, don't sit in a closet for an afternoon like some people do. Sorry. Yeah. So I, I'm quite interested. This is like one of my things. And it's funny, like we haven't really talked about this before. We're doing this podcast almost a year and a half. We haven't talked about this. And dark adaptation and dark adaption is, is one of my favorite things to think about and, and to work on. So um, one thing is vitamin A. You need good vitamin A for proper functioning eyes because uh, there's photopigments that rely on this. Uh, that's called, uh, the main one is called rhodopsin, which is um, for your rods rods and rhodopsin. There mm-hmm. you go. Um, so the, these are the ones that promote uh, good uh, eye health, right? Um, so vitamin A is present in both animal and plant sources. Uh, and, and now I'm going to get into this a little bit, like retinoids and carotenoids, uh, respectively. Sort of you get the retinoids from the animal and the uh, carotenoids, like kind of like carrot, um, from plants, although carrots aren't listed here on the stuff that I've listed, but anyway, so, um, they're used by the body for the absorption, uh, uh, of, of these, um, you know, nutrients into your cardiovascular system. So it's important to have a good cardiovascular system, like getting good cardio exercise is actually super important for your night vision. So, you know, in, in full disclosure, um, I was trying to get more exercise and uh, this was a number of years ago, and um, um, my wife wanted to buy an exercise bike, and I was like, I'm not going to use it. And then kind of as I was doing some of this reading, I'm like, you know what, I'm going to start trying to do like 10 to 15 minutes of cardio a day, like really focused. I, I do other exercise, but I was thinking this is something I'm, I'm going to do for my health. And in part, I get into it because of uh, reading this stuff on the the general health, as well as, as on eye health and, and being uh, fit for astronomy, you know, um, let's see fruits, vegetables, um, dairy products, fish, fish is really good. People should eat uh, a lot of fish. Um, I ate, I ate a pound and a half of fish last night. <laughs> so I live, I live this reality. Um, one thing, one thing people can do, you know, and I'm not a nutritionist or anything, but because of, um, you know, I guess for lack of, of a long description is severe allergies. Um, but one thing people can do is eat some, some greens before they eat a meal. If you eat, if you eat just a handful of like, uh, spinach before you eat a meal, uh, do that for a month and then, and then come and complain to me because your overall health will get this huge benefit by eating a large handful of spinach before you eat your dinner every evening. Um, it does some amazing things, but anyway, and it also really helps you out for doing astronomy. 
Um, fruits and vegetables contain uh, high amounts of carotenoids. Uh, you want to look for vegetables that are dark green like spinach, um, yellow like your peppers. I eat um, yellow peppers and red peppers conversely every single day for lunch and red ones, red in color. So I also eat red ones. And um, you want to eat your tomatoes and your berries, like your raspberries and your strawberries um, and different things like that. So, you know, this seems like strange things to talk about on an observing uh, podcast, but actually eating these fruits and vegetables, uh, which I know can be expensive, but, you know, certainly uh, you can eat frozen ones or whatever um, that can sort of help you out on that. But uh, we're, we're giving nutritional advice today, Shane. Well, and it, it makes sense, right? Like, um, you know, good health enables you to do lots of different things or, or allows you to do things better. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's no surprise to me, you know, that, you know, just a balanced diet with the right, uh, nutrition, you know, is going to make your eye perform better too. And, and probably even just give you more energy while you're out at night and not uh, make you feel so tired. Yeah. So so for me, what's, what's strange, like you were saying, like your vision, maybe you have some visual challenge. I certainly do. I have, um, uh, really bad astigmatism, right? So like, it's, it's funny because some people really love the super expensive, well-corrected eyepieces and, and I enjoy them too. But for me, it's not as critical because I never get like really sharp edges. Of the, I just live with it and my eye adjusts and my brain adjusts. It's not that big a deal for me. Um, to have like really expensive eyepieces that are really well corrected on the edge because um, my vision just isn't good in those areas anyway. So, uh, you know, to do astronomy, like I'm already just adjusting and adapting to that. However, I have really good night vision. I always have. And when I read through the list, so I made up this list. This, this is like a list of my favorite foods and it always has been and it has nothing to do with astronomy. But when you read this, like one of my favorite things to eat is red onions and I will just eat red onions. My wife thinks it's kind of gross, but I really like them. And blueberries, I've always eaten like, like when I was a kid, like growing up, um, we live near the blueberry capital of the world. We only live like about 50 kilometers away. And so blueberries were like really cheap. Like that, that was like a really cheap thing. You would just get blueberries all summer and you would eat them on everything because it's just really cheap and they're healthy. And so, um, that was just something we always had fly, like a flat of blueberries in the fridge all summer. And then we'd freeze them and have them throughout the year. Um, bilberries, which are kind of like a blueberry. I never really have eaten a bilberry. I think I sought them out. They were, they were okay. I've eaten them. Um, they're, they're hard to get. Um, I've taken bilberry supplement and, uh, I haven't really noticed an improvement in my vision taking a supplement. So I just don't because I eat so much of this stuff anyway. Uh, red cabbage, which I actually like, and eggplant, which I love. I can never get enough. Of it. I don't eat as much of it as I would like to. Um, but those those are all things that that really help improve your um, dark adaption. And then it's not right here. I think I have it somewhere down. But oh yeah, blackberries. Apparently blackberries are really good. And when I was growing up, um, I I grew up in in an area like where I spent my summers, um, our, our old cottage. And man, this was pretty rough. It was a chicken shed that had been converted to a cottage. They literally swept the feathers out and we moved in. Um, and it was, it was in a burn, like the forest had burned and the whole hillside was covered in a combination of blueberries and blackberries. And so we would just go out and this is, we just would eat them. Like this is what we would have all the time, all summer, we would just eat blueberries and blackberries because they were really good and they were right there and they were free and so we just ate them all summer and then we'd pick crab apples in the fall and make jam. Um, so, so it was like a really great spot. And it just turned out that probably eating all that stuff all summer for my whole life growing up probably gave me pretty good night vision, sort of strangely enough. Yeah. It all worked out for you. And, uh, sounds like, you know, you've just, you were destined to become an, an amateur astronomer. That and you know, horrible insomnia. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So, <laughs> and then some of the other things, um, one thing that's really bad so to kind of go on the flip side, things that, that you shouldn't do not to tell people what to do and not to do is, um, smoking is really bad, um, for your vision. I have never been a smoker and it's always been something that I, I haven't even enjoyed being around. Um, 
so that that's another thing. If if you smoke, that will in, impinge your night vision, and you won't be able to see the stars as well for sure. And same with alcohol use. Um, I've always been a very light drinker, um, even lighter now. But I I never drank much uh, growing up. I didn't have time for it. I, I was I was an athlete. And then um, exercise uh, definitely. If you don't get enough exercise, um, you will not have good dark adoption. Um, you should get some, you know, like they say, like whatever it is like that, uh, minimum of, of 10 to 15 minutes a day, kind of on average. Um, if you're not getting that, you can go out, like, say you're, you know, maybe you're smoking and drinking and partying too much. You cut that down, start eating healthy and, and getting some good rest and eating your, your blueberries and blackberries and eggplant. Um, you will, you will definitely see more in the nighttime sky. Um, that is, that is for certain. And I actually have noticed this. So there's been the odd night. Um, then this is the odd night where we go out and it looks like the conditions are going to be poor. And I remember we had some, uh, we had some beverages there. So we were like, whatever, we were out camping and, um, the conditions were looking like they were going to be horrendous. And, um, I think we had a, had a drink or two and then it cleared up. And I remember, I definitely noticed that, um, that I couldn't see nearly as well. Like it was, it was not good. Um, I definitely didn't enjoy it as well. That, that was the very last time I ever had any alcohol beverage anytime, anywhere near, I thought I was going to go observing. Even if I thought I was going to go observing, it was 50, 50. I, I will not have anything to drink like that day. And I don't drink that much anyway. So it's not a big deal for me. Yeah. Yeah. Both of those smoking and drinking affect some of that biology that allows your eye to adapt, but you know, there's, there's another reason to not do that while astronomy or doing astronomy and, you know, the smoking part, um, you know, if, if that smoke is anywhere near your optics, it can, you know, start to leave film behind and, and kind of compromise some of the, uh, the glass, you know, that you use. Yeah. Um, and, and alcohol, you know, depending on, you know, even if you just have one or two, it does impact your like, you know, response time and all of that stuff. And, you know, that's when you, potentially drop a real expensive eyepiece or, you know, maybe trip over the, the telescope tripod and damage yourself or the, the equipment you're using. So, you know, I, I think there's a number of reasons to, uh, to avoid both, um, while doing astronomy, although, you know, occasionally I will have a, you know, a cold beverage when I'm in the backyard in the summertime looking sure. at the planets, yeah. but, um, it certainly is something, uh, that I, I don't do very often. And like you mentioned, when we, when we are under a dark sky, um, there's effort to get there, particularly when we go down to grasslands national park, because, you know, you're driving 300 kilometers and you're, you know, you're packing a lot of stuff to, to live off the land for a couple of days or not off the land, but on the land. Yeah. And, um, you know, when, when I put that kind of effort into astronomy, then everything else becomes, a much lower priority in my life because I want that astronomy session to be as good as it possibly can. So, you know, yeah. all of this stuff, uh, all my bad habits get thrown out the window and, you know, try to focus on uh, doing everything right to um, make sure that I'm seeing as much as I can. Yeah. And I mean, uh, so that people know, I don't know what it's like in the States and I know different places are, or have different restrictions, but um, sort of strangely enough um, it's no problem. It's, it's totally fine to have an alcoholic beverage Um you know, at your campsite in, in a Canadian national park, that is, that is no problem at all. You are allowed to do that here in this country, um, which is cool. Um, but I've only done that like once or twice, maybe because, uh, you know, when it comes to the astronomy, I do find that if, if I, if I have that drink, then, um, even, even if I have it like at lunch or something, then I'm, uh, it just makes me a little bit more tired at night. Um, it's often very hot. So your body isn't, isn't, processing alcohol as well. Um, you know, it just tends to have that, that sort of negative impact. And then, you know, as time has gone on, I mean, they've certainly discovered that any amount of alcohol can certainly, um, lead to a number of, uh, health and physiological, uh, problems, even in, even in moderate amounts. So, um, people should keep that in mind. And I mean, you know, sort of in full disclosure, like, um, I am a very light drinker. <laughs> like I was, you know, I, I really enjoy having like a beer with somebody like that's great. Um, from time to time, um, but, uh, certainly I, I can go, I can go six or seven months without having a drink. Um, like I did during the, the start of the pandemic, because not getting together with friends for, for a beer or whatever. And, uh, 
you know, uh, 10, just not to drink unless that's the situation. So yeah, I mean, for me, I will go for months and months without having a drink anyway, because uh, certainly the, the recent scientific evidence is that uh, it's, it's not so good for you, but you know, at the same time, I figure once in a while, you know, when, when we get back together and, you know, we're talking about going out to, uh, to this dark side I'm looking at, you know, I, I fully intend that, that we will have a, we'll, we'll sit, sit there and have a beer at some point in time. <laughs> you know, that'll be yep. fun. Looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah. Well, with that, anything else to add, Shane? No, that's, uh, that's it. I, I enjoyed the discussion. Like I said, I learned a little bit through this research, uh, particularly around the amber uh, and red light stuff that, uh, you know, I think will help me uh, in my future observing sessions. So hopefully other people find uh, this information useful. Yeah. And it's, it's sort of a, a different thing, but this is something that we do try to keep in mind when we're going. And, uh, you know, I will say this, um, when you do go to observe with, with other people, um, be very respectful of their level of dark adaptation or their dark adaptation needs um, because everybody is, is different. So what might be a light that you find perfectly acceptable or the level of light that you personally need to do the astronomy that you want to do might be way too bright for that person who's set up 20 feet away from you. And that person is probably named Mike. Um, and, and he's a big guy. Now, <laughs> But, but seriously, I mean, definitely people have, have different levels of sensitivity to it. And, and a lot of people do expect you to, uh, to be uh, aware and respectful of that. And certainly like we've gone out observing and people show up, like one thing that I did recently, is it, it seems like maybe a small thing or whatever is I like to turn on a light in my trunk when I'm putting stuff away. Cause I tend to drop and, and lose things. Um, but I recently put like a red, um, a flap over it. And so I just like, I can flip it up, turn the light on, put the flap down. I still get a little bit of, um, white light in the trunk, but it doesn't spill outside of my trunk. Any light that spills outside of my trunk is, is very dim and red filtered. So it's not really going to impinge on somebody. If I happen to be parked in a way that, um, that might, that might impact, uh, somebody else. And I, I do a lot of observing with Mike. So I was kind of thinking about that. This light's definitely too bright. It's too bright for me, even as we way, way too bright for Mike. Um, so people should think about that. And then things like car alarms and other car lights inside your car, um, be aware that, that sometimes those lights come on. So know how to turn them off, know how to get your car alarm light off or cover it. You know, um, I, there's a couple things in my car. I've just taken little red squares um, of duct tape, put them over. My my mount has a red flashing light on it or sometimes a red steady light, depending on how it's set up. And it's way too bright at a dark sky. So I just took a tiny little red piece of duct tape. I put it over that and it's the perfect level. Nobody would ever complain about it. It's just a dim little red light. I can still see that my mount is doing whatever it needs to do when the red light is on. So it works for me. And it's not like blinding for those that are around me. Because when I'm observing, I actually don't see the red light because I'm perpendicular to it. But my next door neighbor, it's going to be like right in his eye or her eye, you know? <laughs> and so they're not going to be happy. You know, I was talking to Kathleen recently about observing and, you know, she, she wouldn't like that. She's there sketching. She doesn't want a red flashing light in her eye or something, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's a really good point. And, uh, you know, in particular, I think if you're doing astrophotography, um, there tends to be a lot of light from the back display of like, especially if you're using like DSLR, mm. uh, you know, the display of the camera, uh, there's lights involved with some of that equipment. Um, you know, again, the, the people doing visual astronomy won't appreciate that level of light. And, uh, you know, it, it goes back to the, you know, the night vision that we're trying to get, uh, which takes time. And then we want to maintain that. So any unnecessary light or any light that is just too bright, uh, may irritate a neighbor. So just be aware of that. Yeah. One thing I always like, cause I know you, you, and I, you know, you come out and do the odd photograph when we're observing, you don't always do them, but, but you often will do this. Um, but I really appreciate you'll, you'll set it up kind of like 10 or 15 or 20 feet away. And you'll, you'll try to put like a vehicle between us and your camera and kind of maybe angle it just a little different so that like you never impinge upon my night vision. And sometimes you'll walk back and say, well, I wrecked my night vision. 
but you wrecked your night vision. I don't think you've ever impinged upon my night vision with whatever it is that you're doing. And then it's awesome because you'll share photos um, with, with me or whoever else is observing with us. And, uh, and we, we were observing while that photo was being taken. And that, that always uh, to me feels, feels like a special photograph. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, When I do those nights, like if I'm doing any astrophotography, those nights, I almost often uh, will not even set up a telescope because I know that my night vision will be trashed the whole night. So I'll steal views uh, through your guys's telescopes, or I'll bring out the binoculars on, on those nights. But, you know, I'm usually going back and forth to the camera um, just to see what it's doing and then to set up, you know, a new, a new shoot. But, um, uh, you know, and, and part of that is to try to take an inventory or, or be aware of everybody that's around me. And, and yeah, I have no problem walking it off into the distance and making sure that nobody will be impacted by it. Yeah. And I mean, I, I have observed, um, with lots of other people, I know like Veronica, when she's out doing photographs with us, you know, uh, usually I'm messing with her more than she, well, she's never messed with my observing, but you know, (laughs) I'll forget she's even there. And then, She's like, thanks. And I'm like, what? She's like, you just walked with your red light right through my seat. And then she sends me this photo of this beautiful night skyscape with this like, <laughs> like wobbly red light going through it. <laughs> I remember she sent me this one. I'm like, no, I like it. And she's like, I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I think we've kind of covered this well. It, it's sort of not direct observing, but uh, I think I think this is important. This time of year, you know, people might be, you know, hopefully there'll be some star parties happening. I know there's some that are gonna gonna kick up in in the latter part of summer, and so when people are thinking about going out, you know, uh, think about these things. And uh, and as well, like um, if you are somebody that needs a little bit more light, um, maybe instead of getting a really bright red light which might not be the brightest idea, maybe try one of these amber lights. We'll, we'll report back once we make some further progress there. Yeah, perfect. All right. Anything else to add, Shane? No, that's everything. All right. Well, that was fun. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and we hope you enjoyed the show. If you are interested in more information, would like to contact us, or if you would like to support the podcast, check out our website, actualastronomy.com.